Hello and welcome to Must Read Fiction, a place for people who know that life is better with a novel in hand. I'm Erin Papelka, and I'm delighted to be here today with Spokane author Jess Walter. Welcome. Oh, thanks, Erin. Thanks for having me. Truly my pleasure. Jess Walter is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Beautiful Ruins, the national bestseller, The Financial Lives of the Poets, the National Book Award finalist, The Zero, the Edgar Award winning Citizen Vince, the novel Land of the Blind, the New York Times notable book Over Tumbled Graves, and the story collection We Live in Water. His latest novel is The Cold Millions, which we're going to talk about today. He lives in Spokane, Washington with his family. So Jess, let's start with The Cold Millions. For folks who haven't read it yet, please tell me about the book. Yeah, The Cold Millions is the, um, uh, is the story of the early labor movement in the West and specifically in Spokane. Um, it follows two adventuring hobo brothers, Ryan Gig Dolan, who get pulled into the free speech um, protests of 1909 and meet uh, this dynamic labor leader named Elizabeth Gurr. And it's as much, I tried to write it as much a sort of Western page turner as a social novel. So um, I really tried to kind of be the times we were going through, but really graft that on to a, a kind of Western adventure. So, um, so that's The Cold Millions. Oh, amazing. And it, you, you definitely succeeded. It is absolutely a Western page turner okay. and it was very hard to put down. Okay. And in that intro, you, you kind of mentioned some of these really big themes that are coming up in this novel, which, as you said, is set in 1909, but also feels like really present, really contemporary today. Themes of mm -hmm. police brutality, of income inequality, of free speech, of labor organizing. So how did it feel to sort of hold some of those like really current themes alongside your research and alongside writing the book? Yeah, it was really the impetus for writing the book. You know, when, when you watch the country divided into the incredibly wealthy um, and everyone else, you watch the middle class disappear. And I grew up in very much working class, middle class union family. Um, and so it, almost from the beginning, I wanted a way to write about income inequality without being didactic, without just throwing another log on the fire of Twitter. You know, I wanted, wanted this to be, to put it in more historical perspective. Um, and then, and, and I'm writing also about a time of uh, full unrest. And so for that to unfold at the same time that this was sort of happening all around, um, it felt sort of fortuitous and daunting in a way, you know, this is, it felt like a bigger novel than just the adventure story that it was. Um, I didn't have to work very hard to, to create those echoes. They just were there in the story. Um, you know, finding these young people to be the protagonist gig is um, turning 17 in the novel. I mean, Rye is turning 17. Gig is, tw is in his early 20s. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, the labor leader, is 19. And as I looked around me, I just saw so many of these social movements being driven by uh, idealistic young people, whether it's the Parkland shooting survivors fighting for um, reasonable gun laws or young people walking out of schools for climate change. Uh, uh, you know, to, to protest the inaction against climate change or the Black Lives Matters protests. It just felt like, I, um, as I wrote about these young people, you know, charged up to try to change the world all around me. And, and so it felt, um, you know, it felt like if it was possible, I was writing a contemporary historical novel, <laughs> you know, it was not the easiest thing to do. Right, right. And you're right. But I imagine having yourself almost marinated in it in the news probably played yeah. well as you were doing that research, getting marinated in the research. And I imagine those both kind of played off each other really well, too. And not just the news, you know, I was going to protests with my children and, um, you know, during the Trump era, going to a, a protest um, demanding that science be um, be uh, um, respected. Um, you know, for women's rights, for um, for the rights of of African Americans to not be subject to to police brutality, it it 
it really did feel as if there was a sort of shadow world I was living in in the novel that that reflected a little bit the world of you know of the of the early you know 20 2018 to 2021 yeah oh fantastic fantastic well thank you thank you for doing that that work both in the present day and also making it a, a historical historical contemporary novel like it, it definitely holds both of those which is great um and one of the thing that this novel does and all of your work that i just love is you always have this amazing skill of creating this fantastic cast of characters and they all they're so unique and so human and they weave together in mind-boggling ways that seem perfectly clear once you're there and <laughs> and the cold millions is no different like you mentioned we've got ryan gig these brothers who are just coming into adulthood we have elizabeth Gurley flynn the 19 year old pregnant labor activist and organizer you know we have ursula the great a vaudeville performer we have jules the spokane indian we have lemuel brand the mining magnate and that's not even all of them. There are more, and they all sometimes somehow play together and seem really wonderfully human. And so mm -hmm. I'd love, you know, to talk a little bit about your characters. But like, first of all, and this is probably like picking a favorite child. But <laughs> you have a favorite to write, or one that you are really excited to get to explore? You know, there um, there really were characters that I loved writing. I loved writing Ursula the Great. You know, the there were two characters who, by the time I wrote them, I had been thinking about them for quite a while. And so they, it was almost as if they opened a door and announced themselves, the writing of them. And, and part of it has to do with the way I wrote this novel, which is third person. Um, uh, so sort of over the shoulders of Ryan Gig, and they are the main characters. But then I imagine their story like the main tributary of a river and these other channels would come in. And those other channels would be first person stories. And so to get to write Ursula the Great, who just really walks in and announces herself, you know, by saying a woman owns nothing in this world except uh, her memories and it, what a poor return on investment that is. Um, and, and immediately I saw her as this sort of hardened, acerbic, but, um, you know, good hearted person who um, was a really great alternative to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn as these two women are living in a time in which they have almost no agency, you know, 10 years before women have the right to vote, they can't own property. Uh, and yet these two women had very different paths to um, sort of controlling their environment. So Elizabeth Gurley Flynn uh, uh, was also a great character, but I found myself so drawn to Ursula the Great. I just thought, you know, she dances, she sings and dances in a cage with a live cougar. And I remember thinking, what's her trick? What's her trick? And when my imagination came up with the idea that she sews meat into her corset to throw the cougars as she's stripping, um, I just found myself so tickled with both my imagination and with Ursula, who seemed real at that moment. You know, when I, uh, a, a detail like that can just you of your own creation. And, and then I suppose the other one is Del Dalvo, who is kind of one of the villains, I suppose, of the story. But um, as often happens when you find your, when you write into a character, you find their humanity. And there's a brief moment uh, in Del's chapter, which I won't give too much away, but he's a, he's a pretty foul Pinkerton who's come to, uh, uh, you know, to, to uh, challenge our two heroes, Gig and Rye. And there's a moment when he's reflecting on his life and he misses his grandson who is four or eight, he's not sure. And just that one detail um, tells me everything I need to know about Dale, that he maybe hasn't been the best grandfather if he can't pinpoint his grandson's age any closer than that. So I would say those two characters were great fun to write. They're big characters, all like being in actor it's the smaller um scene stealing parts sometimes i think that are more fun to play oh absolutely and those like little details also like you said as a reader really you're like oh i can see them now like i get that detail right and what i loved about yeah. ursula is that she also had this huge range where yes she was like stripping with a cougar and she had this voice that i could hear off the page right like i could imagine this beautiful singing voice oh, to go along so yeah. with that stage presence and so yeah it just kind of made for a really like fun character to read so it's, it's exciting to hear which ones were fun to write too 
and, and and as an actress who had who had fallen at this heart into this hard place in her career, I just immediately had this empathy for her, this sense of who she was. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you for writing her and writing Dell and creating this fantastic cast of characters that we get to enjoy. Um, my next question, it actually, you sort of like led into it, you know, you with your choice of words talking about characters as the main channel and then these tributaries because the Cold mm -hmm. Millions also has the presence of the Spokane River, which is both very much so part of the novel and also very much so part of, of the city of Spokane, both 100 yeah. years ago and today. And so tell Tell me more about the Spokane River. What is your relationship with the river and how did it feel to write it and research it in the novel? I mean, that's such a great question. I have always lived along this river um, almost my whole life. Uh, grew up right next to it. Uh, right now I live just above its banks at the, uh, in a part of town where I'm overlooking the, the river gorge. And so it, it's as much a part of my writing process. I walk along it thinking all the time. And it became, it, you know, it, it frames the city. The city is here because this river is here. You know, like most cities are, are on ports or they're, you know, and so it, you can't tell the story of Spokane without telling the story of this big wide channeled short river. It's not very long before it hits the Columbia out of the mountains and lakes of North Idaho and, you know, slams right into the Columbia River. And so it, it, it both a huge part of the story and it was also the organizing principle of the novel. Um, the very first bit of the story takes place at Plants Ferry, the first crossing of the river um, in, in uh, 1864. And then the last the novel takes place in 1964 um, when a uh, character, I won't give too much away, but one of our main characters, you know, is taking walks along the river. And, and in that hundred years, I was able to think of one of my favorite novels. And for me as a novelist, it's really helpful to um, have your aspirations be larger than your talent. And so I'm often um, carrying different books along with me that I hope to emulate or to channel or or to just be inspired by. And so for this book, I kept thinking of 100 Years of Solitude, the Gabriel Garcia Marquez novel, which is one of my favorites, which um, tells the, the story of 100 years of a city. And I wanted to tell 100 years of this city and this river. Um, and then the other novel that was with me the whole way was, of course, War and Peace, which is a book that the characters are reading throughout it. To have great books that you, that, you know, sort of, of guide you through it. I think of them as like the North Star, you know, you're writing and you just keep looking up at something so grand and great that it, you know, keeps pushing you along. And, and for me, the, you know, to have the novel structured like a river, to have so much of the action take place along the river, and then to tell the story of how this city ended up on this river, it all had a, uh, it, it had a kind of, um, connectivity that that made theme connect with plot connect with structure in a way that um as as a novelist makes me really happy mm -hmm. i mean almost like the holy trinity right there you know theme connecting with structure connecting with plot right <laughs> like so beautiful and i love that yeah, you mentioned yeah. 100 years of solitude a friend of mine um who is a native spanish speaker was talking about that book one time and he said that the ending in spanish the language is just like waterfall oh, after waterfall after I waterfall which is yeah. just also not so different from the spokane river right you know which is like the falls and then more falls and then you know the rapids even further down and so certainly you, that was definitely channeled pun intended you know kind of through that novel yeah right yeah and and i think you know it's thing fiction has in um in its back pocket is it's able to to use time in a way that very other very few other mediums are you can read a novel and feel like you have seen a hundred years past or you've seen the whole life of these characters or even a month or even a day and and you know, time being a river is is one of the oldest metaphors there is. And so I, as a writer, you often come back to that idea of the river as um, uh, as sort of the movement of time through through the pages of a book. Mm -hmm. 
Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you for playing with time, for playing with the river, um, for sharing a little bit more about your story oh, so. there. Um, which brings me to my last question. So The Cold Millions is your ninth book. Um, congratulations. And so I'd love to hear, like, thank what you. have you learned from the journey of your nine books and the work in progress? And what are you still learning? Wow. Those are great questions. Um, you know, I sometimes I'll talk to young writers and I have to remind myself to not be 55 year old Jess who's written nine books, but to remember what it was like to be 30 year old Jess who was waiting for his first book out or 21 year old Jess who um, dreamed of being a writer or 16 year old Jess who just knew he loved books, you know, and it really is a journey in which you, um, you can only see this far in front of you. You know, you can only see the, the sentence and the chapter and the story that you're struggling on. And if there's anything that I've gained, it's a sense of perspective because now I can look backward. And I think as creative people, as artists, as human beings, we tend to exist on a ladder that has us only looking up as we climb. And so um, we, we don't, the time to look back and think of the steps we've already come up, um, the things we've published, uh, the successes we've had. And so I, I try to remember that there are, you know, people looking up at me thinking, you know, this is, this is what I want to accomplish. And th that both honors you and, um, you know, and, and, and I think makes me reflect on the fact that, um, you know, that it, the, it, every time I, that every time I tell another writer, when you write a new book, you're starting over, you know, you, um, I may have written nine books, but I've never written the book I'm working on now. And so I feel just as uh, insecure, naked, um, incapable of pulling it off as, as the first book I wrote. Uh, I'm trying to put together a story collection right now. And I, about three months ago, I just threw a dread panic and just read six story collections because I suddenly had no idea what a story collection even was. Like, why are these stories together? How do they fit together? Which one goes first? Which one goes last? I felt again, like that 18 year old, that 21 year old, that 30 year old, you know, how do I do this? And there's something really beautiful in that. And if I can both have the perspective of someone who's done this a number of times and the, the fresh creative, um, fear that, um, which I think is healthy and is how you create things, then um, I feel like blending those two things is, is kind of what keeps me writing. It's like the engine of creativity, balancing those two things every day. Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, it does feel like creativity and fear, like they can't, they, you can't go one without the other, right? Like they, they come together. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the, there are so, there's so many of those sort of dualistic things, you know, I, I used to think that I would either had to be humble or confident. Um, and now I realize they're like the two pedals on a bicycle. You know, um, I push my confidence until my humility kicks in. And then I push my confidence until my humility kicks in. And, um, and in that way, I'm able to travel down a road and write sentences. And, um, you know, and I think that, you know, the, we're constantly trying to, you know, to pump up our confidence as writers and which is great. It's good that we're doing that, but I think it's incredibly important to, um, you know, we, we aspire to do something great and, uh, and, and it's okay to not always get there, you know, it's okay to have your, 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 the reality not quite live up to your aspirations. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I do feel like that's part of the creative process, at least for me too, is that you start a project and then you, you know, are super excited about the idea and then you start to make it and you're super disappointed by the thing that you've made and the process of coming to terms with it into loving it for what it is, <laughs> is also part of the creative process, right? Totally. It's, it's not the idea, but yeah. it's still this beautiful thing that you made, you know? So yes, which is part of the journey, I, right? I, well, and, it, and so much of that is baked into the process itself. I used to joke that when I start a novel, it, it's so expansive. There's that part where it's just expanding out. And I always feel like I'm creating 
rehearsal of the great as a live human being. I'm creating, you know, and I'm so filled with um, uh, with this grandiosity. And then sometimes I'll finish a chapter or a book and I'll think, yeah, I created life, but it's like that tall. And then all it can do is backflips, you know? <laughs> it's like uh, there's, um, there's something in the end that thing that's so expansive becomes the thing you you meant it to it almost closes itself back and um so yeah, i i suppose having a longer career makes you less worried about those patterns you know um i to think of my writing journal i keep back on the wall there's just um shelf after shelf of writing journal and i used to think of them as um as almost the diaries of someone who lives on the ocean has no comprehension of tides and so it would be like you know the water is disappearing it's going away it's never coming back oh my god it's coming in it's a giant flood and my creativity felt that it's like oh i'm such a terrible writer i'll never write again and then the next day it's like when will i win the nobel prize this is so good and um you know the tides going in the tides coming out and um uh, you know, I, I, I still sometimes, you know, feel like my journal reads like that, you know, like the, um, uh, you know, like, like someone who's just, you know, uh, will, will never learn that these things come and go like that. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that window into the journey. It's certainly great reassurance um, for all of us, both writers and anyone, you know, in doing any creative work and all of us humans to know, yes, the tide's going to come in and the tide's yeah. going to come out. And that's just all part of it. Well, I can certainly say the tide came in with the cold millions. It's such uh, a great book. Uh, uh, folks who are watching, please do check it out. Give it a read. You won't be sorry. And Jess Walter, thank you. Thank you so very much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you, Erin, and thank you for your great enthusiasm for books and writing, and that's uh, terrific. Thank you. Ah, uh, truly my pleasure. Thank you.